Welcome everybody. My name is Blake LaCasey. I'm a partner at This By Them. I do all the development stuff with Scott. I also do some theme work, theme work um, basically anything architecture-wise, module development. Uh, I've been doing module development for about probably three years. Uh, the first, I got started right before I actually did my first summer of code pro project, uh, just kind of getting used to things, but um, I was a participant with the Google Summer of Code program in 2007. Uh, with the Drupal project, and for the project, I, I wrote a search engine module which did fuzzy matching, so it broke all the words up into three character bits and stored all those, and then you'd search through and it would find matches uh, that weren't necessarily exact matches. Um, and actually, during doing that experience helped me learn about all the core hooks, basically everything that was going on because I read through the entire search module line by line and, and debugged things and figured out what was going on, and, and in doing that, it really gave me perspective on, on how Drupal works as a whole, but also how like hooks can be used to modify things and how you can add your own hooks as well to provide functionality for, for other module developers or other modules to interact with your module. A uh, really great book that I would recommend is, um, sorry, let me actually play this. Um, the book that I used when I was learning was the uh, Pro Drupal Development book. Uh, we were all given that actually for free by Acrest. It was very nice of them um, as part of the, the program. And uh, I would recommend if you're looking at doing anything more than building a site with the, the admin interfaces, get that book. There's a new version out for Drupal 6. It is fantastic. Uh, it's actually gotten even bigger for Drupal 6, but it will walk you through creating your own modules, uh, all the theming. Basically, everything you need to know about Drupal, you can learn from that single book. Okay. Um, another resource, I think actually, it's the Pro Drupal Development Book, and it is absolutely fantastic. Um, another resource uh, you guys should use, the api.drupal.org. That will tell you about all the hooks that are available in core. If you go to api.lolabot.com, and I'm pretty sure that's the right address, <laughs> but Lolabot has their own API, and it actually includes documentation for contributing modules as well. So you'll find views hooks, you'll find uh, CCK hooks, you'll find other hooks that are available for contrib modules that you probably use on a daily basis. And uh, that's really helpful because sometimes when you're searching through code, it's hard to find the hooks and documentation for those because you can't actually search for hook underscore whatever. And if you do, it'll come up with a bunch of different results and it's kind of messy. So use the API, that's what it's there for. There's also in the handbooks, the Drupal handbooks, there's module developers handbook. Uh, that's really helpful too for getting you guys kind of up and going with, with creating modules. It takes you through creating an info file, uh, your first module file, etc. cetera. Uh, I wanted to kind of skip over a little bit of that because I want to get into the hooks specifically and show you guys what's possible with the hooks. And um, these are the tools I'll be using today. The admin menu at the top is the black drop down nav bar. Develop module, you'll use that whenever you're developing modules because it gives you an easy way to print out your variables so you can actually see what's going on in your hook implementations. And your, I use Mozilla, Firefox, and Firebug to look at markup and uh, debug any JavaScript stuff that I have on the front end of things. So what are hooks? Uh, anyone from a programming background, uh, object oriented programming, it's basically an event. Okay, so when an event happens, um, no matter what module it's happening in, uh, you can fire off a, a, a hook or an event to say all you modules out there who want to change this here's the data go ahead and change it okay so it's like um, yeah I don't really have a really good analogy but yeah that's what happens <laughs> um, hooks are implemented by creating specially named functions located in your module uh, some keywords that are implemented in the documentation throughout the code you'll see a comment that says implementation of and then the hook name. That's an easy way. If you're writing implementations of hooks in your own modules, that's a really good way to document your code because someone else coming in that may be new, they know what that function is specifically for. It's actually a hook implementation. It's not an actual, it's not just a function that you're writing on your own. Okay. Um, another thing, they're specially named functions. Okay. Hooks get fired. Because of the way that, that Drupal works and it's, it's not object oriented, there's namespace conflicts that can arise if you have two function names that are exactly the same. So the way that they've implemented the hooks is you use the name of your module as the beginning part of your function 
and then you end it with an underscore in the name of the hook that you're implementing. Okay, and I have an example here we can go through, but it's just important to understand that you create specially named functions in your module <coughs> that end up getting fired when these events happen. Okay, uh, Drupal uses naming conventions. I just went over that. Implementing a hook. So let's pretend you have a module called Drupal Camp. Okay, when you want to implement a hook called Hook Menu, which we'll go out over afterwards, you would define a function in your module called function Drupal Camp underscore Menu. Okay. Another thing is, don't forget about defining the parameters for your function. And all the hooks have the parameters that need to be defined when you implement those hooks. And you can look at that on the api.drupal.org, and we can walk over that as well. But that is an important thing that when you implement these functions, uh, every hook has different ar arguments that it's passing into it, different, different data, different information. And you need to define your hook Im implementation in the way that that module wants you to do that. Okay, how many people have I lost so far? Awesome. Okay, here's an, uh, another background thing. Uh, in PHP, you can pass variables by reference. I've included a link, actually, for you to read about it. If you type in PHP pass by reference in Google, you'll probably get the same thing. And um, what it normally in a function, you receive parameters, you receive arguments, which is, could be any type of data. When you, when you define an argument as being passed by reference, anything you do to that variable within that function, within your function, it changes the variable for the rest of its lifetime. It permanently changes it. Um, places where you see this is in the preprocess functions, in the theme layer. It passes in a variable called vars, and you define it with the passed by reference, because you can actually modify the variables that go back out into your template, function, template files. Okay, so there's plenty of examples, and you need to know you need to know what the ampersand is for. Um, moving forward with doing your own hooks. Okay, so example hooks could be hook node API. So that allows you to manipulate node data. So when you're inserting new nodes, you're updating nodes, you're deleting nodes. Even search is actually done through that. There's hook node API implements an operation called search or uh, update index, right? So you can actually add additional information to your search index whenever it's being on your cron jobs. So say you have a node and CCK does this by naturally for you. It'll actually say, oh look, hook, hook node API is fired for the update index operation. Well, I have all these fields and all this, inf all this data about this node. I want to add that back into the search index. And it does that using hook node API. Okay, and that's how you can actually extend these other modules without touching any of the, their module code. You can do it all in your own code, and you can maintain that completely separately because of the event system going on. Okay. Um, another implementation is hook user. Uh, there's operations like login, updating profile. Um, there's, there's more. We can go over that. But basically, whenever someone logs in, it'll fire hook user and say, hey, someone's logging in, and your function has the opportunity to do whatever it wants to on that. Okay. Um, the same thing with, like, they've saved their profile or they're updating their profile or a new user is being created, you have opportunity there to uh, modify things. Hook menu is a way that the Drupal core can find out about new menu callbacks that your module provides. Any of the core modules provide hook menu. Uh, an e a easy example would be, hook, uh, would be the node module. The node module says, uh, hey Drupal, I have a new menu callback called node slash argument, right? You've all seen that before. And basically what it does is it tells the Drupal core menu system that when someone visits the node path and passes in some node ID, that this node function should be called, okay? And so that's how the whole node system works. It, it uses that menu callback to, to look in the database, find the node ID, load the node, Perform its own, you know, provide its own hooks in addition to that. So when you're viewing the node, it fires off an additional hook. Um, and we can show an example of that. Hook form alter is really cool because you can alter any of the forms across any, any of your site. So you'll see modules like, uh, like taxonomy is a good instance. The taxon taxonomy module is completely separate from the node module. Yet when you add a taxonomy term and a vocabulary, you're actually able to choose those taxonomy terms in your node forms. That's all done through form alter, right? So taxonomy's module says, 
when you're loading any of the no node edit or add forms, add these form elements as well. Okay, so that's a really perfect example of that. Um, through my experience and the way I learned, I found that uh, going through the core modules, seeing how the core modules interact with one another, reading through that code, it helped me not only learn PHP, um, because I am self-taught with uh, PHP coding and stuff, helped me learn that, but it also helped me learn you know, how Drupal specifically worked and some good practices in, in general. Because all the code is, I mean, any, any patch that makes it into Drupal core has been looked at by probably at least 50 people and at a minimum. So you're talking about some really well-written code, and it's all formatted the same way, so it's easy to follow. Um, all, and, and all the actually naming conventions are, are held very consistently. Documentation is done very well, so it's a good place to start. Um, also remember that the contributed modules will implement hooks and provide their own hooks as well. Uh, so uh, what's a good one? Views. Views, for instance. Views provides hooks so that the flag module can provide its own way of delivering information about flag module specific stuff. If views didn't have those hooks, other modules wouldn't be able to, to build on top of what views already provides. Okay. Same thing with CCK. The only reason the CCK fields are able to be shown in views is because CCK itself has implemented the hooks. Well, actually, views does it for CCK, so it's kind of a, a bad case because views module uh, implements those for a core module, but um, anything else you download, like node queue, uh, flag module, any of those things, they actually provide their own implementations of views hooks. Okay. Can you guys read that? Is that too small? Hopefully. Pretty small. Pretty small. All right. Um, I'll go over it with a, a little bit bigger, but this is an implementation of hook node API. Um, we'll go to the next one. So, can you see that better, or do I need to? Uh, I'm going to go to code. Forget it. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, I already have it. Okay. Where is this? Twitter. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a Twitter module. Maybe everyone's not so familiar with it, but it's kind of a good example, a uh, good place to start. Pretty simple. Um, here's the hook menu implementation. Is this too small for you guys? That's good? Okay. It's clear? Okay. So here's here you can see the Twitter module. It's called twitter.module. Okay. Uh, it's defining its own implementation of hook menu. Okay. And the way that the hook is written, it expects you to return an array of menu callbacks. Okay. And in this particular instance, the hook doesn't actually send you any data. So there's no parameters. There's no arguments defined. Okay. So what we're doing is saying, hey, hey Drupal, we want to provide a couple new menu callbacks so that when people visit this path, admin settings Twitter, we give the page this title. Uh, this is a description which is used in the admin side of things. We define a page callback, which is a function that gets called whenever someone visits that page. Okay. We define any of the arguments that we're expecting, and in this case, since we're calling Drupal get form, which is a form builder function, which um, is actually out of scope for this, but we're calling this this form builder function, and in, in this case, we actually end up calling Twitter admin form because that's how the form API works. And if you guys read up on that, it'll be very clear. Um, but this basically gets sent as a uh, as an argument back into this callback function, okay? Which in turn, because the way the Drupal get form works ends up calling this function back on its own. Um, and then you have access arguments, which you can define any of the permissions that people must have in order to visit that particular menu callback. Okay, so if we didn't, if the user visiting this particular page, admin settings, Twitter, if they didn't have access to administer the site configuration, then they would be shown a 404 page, or 301, I guess, not access denied. Okay. Um, at the end of this, we have an array of two items. We return that array back. And now, now Drupal set can can know that when someone visits one of those paths, to send it to send us into this module. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Did I go too quick? Any questions? Okay, so that's an example of hook menu. 
Um, here is a really easy example. This is a really basic one. It's hook perm. And you define hook perm when you, you want to add your own permissions for your module. So all of you have seen this implemented. When you go to the permissions page for the user settings, every module that returns any permissions gets shown up in that screen. Okay, and this is something that Drupal core handles for us so that we don't have to write access control on our own. Using the hook system, it's able to gather whatever, whatever permissions it needs to know about, and then later on you can use other functions to check for those permissions. Okay, so here all we're doing is returning an array with the permissions that we want this module to provide. Okay, and so let's go into the, the admin screen and take a look. Um, this particular instance, we should be looking for add Twitter accounts and use global Twitter account. So user management, permissions. And you see here is all of our roles across the top. And if you look down for the Twitter module, you can actually define your own permissions. And that's how, that's how easy it is. Okay. Let's go back down. Um, here's a different hook. This is hook user. Uh, the similarities between hook user and hook node API are, uh, and actually a few other hooks as well. The first parameter is called op, and what that means is hook user is used for a number of different operations, like I talked about before. Say the user is saving their profile information, they're logging in, they're uh, deleting an account, whatever it may be. The same hook fires for each of those events, but they use a variable called op as what operation is going on at that particular time. It's kind of cool. Um, I like it because then anything, if I want to do anything on any of the user actions, I know what function I'm looking at. I'm looking for my implementation of hook user, and then I can look through there to figure out, you know, in this case, it's providing new categories. Uh, this op, the op value got pa that got passed in is called categories. And in that particular instance, it, re it expects a particular variable to be returned. Um, let's go ahead and look at some of the documentation for hook user really quick, and maybe that will help show you guys uh, a little bit more about what's going on. So again, I'm going to go to api.drupal.org. I'm going to type in hook user, and like that, it magically pops up. And it's also important that you're on the right version because you'll notice here that, uh, well, in this particular case, the, the function never changed. But in some cases, like the L function in Drupal 6, the parameters were changed. So the actual, um, the API itself has changed. That's why we have major versions of Drupal. If you're using Drupal 6, for the, throughout the lifetime of Drupal 6, any of the hook definitions will not change. Okay? But as soon as they go to Drupal 7, that's... From six to seven is the opportunity that the core developers take to maybe enhance the way that the hooks work or change the, the functionality, or provide additional functionality. Okay? So this particular instance, we have four parameters, four arguments that we have to define in our own implementation of the hook. Okay, and if we look back at the Twitter module, we'll see we have op, we have edit, account, and category. Uh, it's also important to know when they define things by reference, you have to do that as well. Um, well, I guess you don't have to, but if you make any changes to those variables, those changes won't be stored afterwards. Okay, uh, particularly like in hook user, if you change the edit variable or change the account variable, that'll actually change things before user maybe the object maybe it's saved. And same thing for node, you're able to actually um, change the way that the node object gets saved if you if you modify those variables in your own hook. Um, another important thing. Uh, is the default. So in PHP, you define a default value for a parameter that may or may not, or for an argument that may or may not be sent with the hook. And so if someone calls, if one module, like the hook, if the user module says, I want to fire off hook user when someone logs in, uh, the category usually isn't defined because it's irrelevant for that particular operation. And so in that case, the category variable will be defined as null. Okay? So let's take a look here. In the documentation, it says, hey, these are the parameters. And for the op value, there could be a number of different operations. And as you can see, there's quite a few of them. 
um, and it also helps you figure out what each of them does. So for our particular instance, the Twitter module provides a set of user information categories which are requested. So in the, in the edit profile tabs, you'll see if you install the Twitter module, it'll give you a new option to select uh, Twitter next to edit. Okay. Um, we could also implement uh, a delete. So when a user account is deleted, we could perform operations. If a user uh, is being inserted or added, um, actually the op will always be insert on an add and it will be update on a save. Okay, so if you're looking for add and save, those actually don't exist. They, they use the, the more uh, SQL specific terms for insert and update for those operations. Um, load, so this is kind of cool. Whenever a user object is being loaded, uh, you have the ability to add additional values to that user object. Okay, and then uh, we'll go down here, op. So it also defines the other parameters. Okay, also tells us about the return values and, and what our function should return if it needs to return anything. Okay, so for our particular instance, uh, we're implementing hook categories. It's expecting an array with name, title, and weight values. So if we go back to our code, we are looking for the op equal to categories. And when that event fires, we're returning an array of multiple arrays, could be multiple categories, um, with a name, title, and weight, just like it told us in the API. Okay. Do I have any questions so far? Do you have any questions so far? So in order to, uh, to implement hook user, you need to return values that are expected in the documentation? Yeah, the question is, in order to implement hook user, do we need to return the values that are expected? Um, yes and no. In this particular case, this function, Twitter underscore user, this is actually getting called every time someone logs in, every time someone inserts a new, new record. Uh, and, uh, they create a new user account, so sorry. Um, so the, the user account's getting updated. Uh, the user account's getting loaded. Anytime that happens, this function is getting called, and we have an opportunity at that point to modify any of the variables that are getting passed in, in addition to perform our own operations, like uh, say when someone logs in, we want to see if they've logged in before, and then send an email to them saying, hey, welcome, I saw you just logged in for the first time. Okay, and I can actually go through and write that code for you guys. That might be a good, easy example for us to walk through. Okay, um, but back to the question, we're only operating... We're only performing an action when this particular operation is happening, in categories. And when, when that actual operation is, is fired, it expects us to return an array of arrays. So you'll see that there's no return value defined for some of the operations. And in that case, you don't actually need to return anything. Uh, you could actually just modify the, the pass by reference values. And in that case, those values will be changed and you'll be able to do what you need there. Or you can just do your own stuff and not have to tell anyone else about it. Okay. Um, are there any questions? I think maybe we'll go ahead and do the, the user login thing. That might be kind of a cool example. Uh, go ahead. Is there any need to That's absolutely, yeah. Okay, so the question was, is there a way to modify the precedence? And there is. And it's in the system table. If you go into your Drupal tables in the database, there's a, a table called system. And it, lo it, it, it tells Drupal about all the modules that are available. Status is one, means it's a module that's been enabled. There's actually a weight column. So you can change the weight of the module so that when, what happens when these hooks fire is basically Drupal goes through the database, says, Show me all the modules that are enabled. Sort them by alphabetical order, or sort them by weight, and then by alphabetical order. Okay? And then what it does is loops through each of the function names and sees if a function is defined with the module name underscore the hook. And if it is, then it calls that function and passes in the values. If it's not, it moves on to the next module. Okay? And that's, that's how the module system works. Okay? So what you can do is you can go in and you can modify the weights of the modules so that your module may come afterwards with weight 10, or it could be before with weight negative 10. Okay. Um, one important thing to know is when you change the weight, it changes it for all the hook implementations. So recently on a project, I had to write two different modules 
because I needed something to fire off before the taxonomy hook came in, and then also after, like a node key hook came in. Okay, so I couldn't define the weights uh, differently because I, I had only one module. Okay, so that, that that would be an instance where you might need to separate your functionality into two different modules to to accommodate the the hook event firing. It's a really good question. Um, can you add Uh, the question is, can you add hooks on the fly like you do in JavaScript? Uh, the answer is no, uh, not after the page has been loaded. So your hook code goes into PHP, so as the page is being loaded, uh, actually as the page is being built before it's even being loaded in the browser, all the hooks have, hooks have fired, uh, Drupal's already put together all the HTML content and then it's delivered to the screen. So uh, if you have a module and it's been enabled and you're working on like your local machine, you can actually modify the code, add a new hook, and not need to clear cache or anything, and that hook will fire off. So I guess, yes, you can enable it on the fly, but not at that point. Um, question? Back to the example you gave about precedence. So did you code with one module, and then you sort of discovered later that you needed to uh, modify something before and after, and then split it up? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the question was, did I, did I write one module and then realize after the fact uh, the answer is yes, and it was actually a module particular to an, an, a specific implementation that we're doing for um, a client, and what needed to happen was I was modifying the way that the taxonomy form gets outputted using form alter, and what happened is that the way that the data came back in Node API, I needed to make those valuables still available in the Node taxonomy array, so I had to do that after the fact, but also I had to perform some other operations that needed to happen before some other hook. So in that case, I just, you know, I, I just had to create another module. And, and how did you discover that, that something was, uh, that you needed to sort of adjust that precedence? Um, experience? No, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, that is a good question because you can, be, you can be debugging values that get passed into your hook all day long, and you're like, why is it not there? You know, like, if your module is called, like, aaa.module, right, and you're looking for some taxonomy terms in hook node API, you know, taxonomy hasn't implemented that hook yet, so that data is not there, right? So it's good to understand how the, the weight system works, to understand at what point your hook's getting called compared to other modules hooks. Yeah. Any other questions? For Go ahead. Yeah, if you have a debugger. Um, there, I don't use a debugger. I probably should. Um, I use Veridump, die and... Uh, DSM for debugging variables and stuff, but yeah, I mean, to, definitely to, to get started on things, a debugger could help. You can uh, set breakpoints and then walk through the code to see, you know, where the what hooks are getting fired, what time, and it'll be very visual for you. Um, I know a lot of people that don't use debuggers though too, and they they do just fine. Um, so yeah, uh, any other questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and. Um, Let's write a new module. We have time, right? Time is okay. So, it's going to be a little, little tight here. Okay, so you'll see that when I start a new module, I go to the sites folder, I go to the all folder, and I go to modules. Um, if you have a lot of custom modules, we'll usually break this up into two folders, one being contrib and one being custom, and then we'll place our modules under there. It's a good standard to have because then you know which, which ones are your custom code and which ones aren't. Um, but it's, there's no requirements on that. So uh, let's go ahead and create a new module called uh, Welcome Email. Okay, and what we need to do, uh, and this is all found in the Drupal handbook, uh, just getting set up stage at, a little bit out of scope. I wanted to get through more than showing how to do the module stuff, but. Uh, you create an info file for your module, and this basically tells Drupal about the module that you're implementing. So you define a name, a description, Oops. the version of core that it needs to, to be able to run. And that's actually new as of Drupal 6. And then we'll go ahead and define a module file. Okay. 
So an important thing when you're doing module development, never close your PHP tag at the bottom of the module file or any of the include files. Um, you only need to find it at the top, and that's for uh, issues that arise with headers being sent and uh, the way that PHP output buffering works. So just it'll say that in the, the handbooks. Just you just don't define the, the bottom PHP close tags. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start our our, our uh, commenting. We're going to implement hook user, right? Uh, okay. Another cool thing, if you're using TextMate or any other editor with with uh, any sort of uh, uh, like snippets, I guess it doesn't have a user. You can actually, you know, like TextMate has a Drupal Drupal plugin um, uh, bundle, I guess it's called, and you can, you know, it has tab stops, so you can type a hook name, hit tab. You notice it already filled in the name of the the module because that's the name of the file, right? So that's my implementation of hook node API. It writes out the implementation documentation at the top, shows me all the operations that happen, and, and it actually it'll let me it'll actually let me tab through and maybe delete some if I don't want to use them. So if you're using TextMate, really cool deal. Check out the uh, the Drupal TextMate bundle. So going back to our hook user implementation, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the API documentation. Hook user. I usually go up here. And I copy the values. Notice I'm going to name the function my module name underscore the hook name, right? I'm going to add the values from the parameters uh, in the documentation. And there we go. Okay. So at this point, let's just go ahead and, and debug what's going on um, for the operations. And this will show you that. Um, this hook is going to run over every every one of those events that happens. So login, update, any of that type of stuff. So now we have a module. This is a very stub module. We haven't really done much except for implement one hook. But let's go ahead and go into our admin system. Okay, other. Since we didn't define a package in our info file, it just throws in another. Um, and we have, hey, welcome email. Okay, and you notice that stuff comes from the info file as well, just background. So we're going to turn our module on. What this does is it adds, a, adds updates to the record in the system table. It says, hey, this module is turned on. Status is set to 1. The weight is default to 0. So this module will actually implement hooks pretty late because, uh, well, it starts with a W. <laughs> Gets sorted down to the bottom. So, uh, well, okay. Automatically, we see this this hook has been fired a number of times. Okay, so it's been higher. It's been fired for the categories operation. Okay, and at that point, uh, we don't have any. There's n there's no data in in the uh, in the account uh, variable, right? Because if you look at the Twitter implementation, all it did was return an array. It didn't need to operate on any accounts or anything like that. Okay. So let's go down here on user load. Uh, this happens during like the bootstrap. So when Drupal loads up, um, it'll call user load for the currently logged in user. It'll go, you know, in that implementation, it goes to the user table, gets your user information, loads the variable, and then let's take a look at what happens in the account values. So now you can see uh, we have a full user object available to us. Okay. I need to plug in. <coughs> okay. So really cool. Uh, what we could do here on user load, uh, we could we could basically do anything that we want using any of the values that are defined there. We could at that point get any variables from the Drupal system table or from the Drupal variable table, we could send off an email, we could uh, FTP a file away, we could do anything we wanted to that PHP allows us, okay? We could insert new data into our own table, say you want to do your own statistics module that logs every time someone you logs, uh, keeps a track of the number of times a user is logged in. So you would implement hook user, uh, the login operation would get, whenever the login operation gets fired, you 
you know, do a SQL query on your own table and update the count of how many times the user logged in. Okay. Um, let's keep going through. Uh, so the load operation actually fired off a number of times. Um, that, that's due to different reasons, and uh, you'd probably have to inspect uh, the core modules a little more, user module a little more, to see why it's, why it's firing off load a couple different times. Um, let's see, let's count it. One, two, one, two, three, four. Um, one's definitely because I'm logged in. I'm not exactly sure what the other ones are for. I don't know. Um, okay, so now what we wanted to do, going back to our example, we wanted to figure out, uh, we wanted to send an email when someone logs in for the first time, or let's go ahead and actually, let's make it a little simpler, let's display a welcome message, message to users when they log in, any, at any time. Okay, so uh, two structures that you'll, uh, uh, that you'll see a lot are ifs and switches. So an if is pretty simple if you're just implementing one operation. Um, and usually you'll see the switch used if you're doing things for multiple different operations. Um, it's a little bit easier to read. It's actually uh, micro performance. It's like switch is a little bit better because it only checks the value once, and it. Um, but that's super over optimization and kind of retarded. But uh, usually use whatever looks and, and reads easiest to you. <laughs> All right. So if op is equal to login, we're going to use a Drupal core function. This is part of the Drupal core API called Drupal set message. Okay, we're going to say welcome to our new website, even though it's already been up for a while. Okay, so let's let's use this as a base. What we can even do after this is we can actually show, hey, welcome username, and we'll go over that as well. So when someone logs in, we're going to show them welcome to our new website message. I'm going to go ahead and load up Safari. Ooh, the power's not working. Has anyone else had issues with the power here? Or actually, so I just can't walk around as much. There we go. Okay. Oh, I'm good. I'm fine. Okay. So you see I'm logged out. I'm going to go ahead and log in. Okay, username. And there's our message. Welcome to our new website. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's add. Let's add, uh, let's add the user's account name. Okay. So uh, for this, we're going to use the T function. Uh, that's a way that we can translate things, and actually we probably should use it here anyways. Um, basically, it'll throw any text through the Drupal IATN eight internationalization <laughs> um, setup so that you can go in and create new language sets and then actually translate the text that's being passed through into different languages. Okay, so let's, let's use this. You'll, you'll notice everything's just the same as it was before. Log out. Log back in. Okay, works just the same. Now, what the T function does give us, though, is a way that we can pass in variables and very cleanly, actually, and still escape um, uh, unwanted characters. So, for like uh, cross-site scripting and stuff, it's it's important to use this. So, uh, let's go look at the T function. Okay, so you can see we pass in a string, which we've done just now. That works just fine. If we don't pass in the, any other parameters, it still operates just as normal, just like uh, using the default default values here. Uh, we can also pass in an array of arguments that get translated into the string uh, using printf format, if, if anyone's familiar. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Um, so let's just let's say here, welcome... Uh, there's different ways you can pass in variables, and it'll outline it here. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, name, names blog, right? 
And then we define an array where we define the value of name to be inserted into our string. Okay, so this is what we're going we're gonna to use the same format. Uh, it's definitely take a look through the T function and, and understand it because there's three different symbols you can use, and each of the symbols uh, escapes characters differently. Okay, so at variable indicates that the text should be run through check plain to escape any of the HTML characters. Okay, percent highlights the value, and you have an exclamation as well, which will pass in completely unchecked HTML value. So that's only what you only want to do that if you know what you're passing through there. If the only way the data that can get passed through there is data that you provide, not any user inputted data. Okay. So for this particular instance, let's use the at symbol. So we'll say welcome username to our website. And we'll say array. And well, we're not really sure yet what that username is. So let's just define it with um, username. Okay. So that's it. We're, we're actually passing in a string called username. And we'll actually swap that out later. But what we need to do is figure out what values are available to us in the hook. So let's go ahead and print the account values again. Because I, I thought we saw last time that we had some values available to us. Okay, so let's log in. Okay, so now you see we get a debug thanks to the develop module. And now we can access any of the values here. Uh, so we'll, let's use name. Uh, we can show them their email address. I think it actually even gives us profile field information. Okay, so the user, the user object has already been loaded with all the profile data as well. So this is going back to the, uh, the question before about you know precedence of, of the hooks firing. Our module is firing at a point where the profile information has already been loaded. So it's already there for us so we can use it. If it wasn't, uh, you could adjust the weight of the module so that it loads afterwards. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do this. Let's uh, let's use the profile full name as our display. So remember, uh, we, we what we printed was account. DSM is telling us that account is actually an object. Okay, it's not an array; it's an object, and these are the properties of the object. Okay, and using PHP, we can actually print those out. So we're looking at the object that is account, and we're accessing the property called profile full name, and that should print out our value that's stored in that, that variable. Okay. So I'll leave the DSM up there so we can see it when it happens again. Let's log out. Log back in. So obviously this is really, really simple, um, very basic usage. There's a uh, almost unlimited number of things you can do with the hook system. Uh, if you do a lot of e-commerce work, Ubercart provides a lot of hooks as well, which is really cool. Uh, you can hook into the process when items get added to the cart. So if you wanted to give discounts uh, when someone you know adds X number of items to a cart or uh, when, it, when a person checks out, you can provide different things like... Uh, Calculate discounts based on you know whatever. There's a whole hooks API specific to Ubercart that you can implement and uh, extend on your website. Go ahead. Back in the code, um, you had an app symbol. One of your arguments. You is, that, is that here? So add username there. Uh, this right here is. Yeah relates back into our T function. So what T does is says, uh, you type out a string and it prints a string. But if you want to substitute values into the string, you define variables uh, using an at symbol, a percent sign, or an ampersand, or an exclamation mark. Okay, and what we read back here in the, in the documentation was that uh, if you want to pass in data that gets escaped, we use the at symbol. So we're actually printing in the account information into that string using T's uh, method of substitution. So definitely whenever you're printing text 
use the T function even though you may not be translating things. Someone else may be implementing the module on a German website or um, you know, Spanish, whatever it is. They need to be able to translate the strings from your module and using the T function allows them to do that easily. Would that be preferable to using uh, Yes, uh, the question is, is that preferable to using checkplane? And the answer is yes, because as you can see here, using the at symbol will actually send the value through checkplane before it gets printed out. So it does that in a way that not only can the strings be translated, but the strings are safe uh, when they're printed to the screen. Um, cool. Uh, we're at 1156. It's about lunchtime. I'd be happy to take any questions you guys have. We can go for another 20 minutes if you want, if you want to ask more questions, see more examples. Um, yeah, any, any questions? I suppose that the at symbol version would be uh, useful if you wanted to have uh, multiple appearances of a given value uh, where the uh, yes printf uh, type version really requires you to apply things in sequence. Right. So the question was. Uh, or, you know, he made a statement saying that using the, the at symbol instead of using uh, a sprint f type syntax, you can reuse it multiple times. So let's go ahead and, and see what it looks like if we say welcome, username to our new website, your profile field name is, is username. Little smiley face. <coughs> Log out, log back in. Okay. So yeah, so you can use that that the actual string multiple times without having to redefine it. So it's just another way of defining a variable that specific to that function type. Cool. Any other questions? Well, you guys must be ready for lunch. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, well, um, okay, I did have one question.